Once upon a time, a distant memory. It's like synergy. Life's the hardest teacher y'all could ever get the master. Get a test first, then y'all get that lesson after. Steve's never stressing them G's to freeze egos. Please, I just get them in threes, like the Migos. Prolific with the music while they browse. I put out my prize to public house. We can send a room the biggest miles. They batter the hundred up with a thousand. See, in the game of life, it ain't a sequel. What's going on, everybody? I'd like to welcome y'all back to the Diagnosis Success Podcast, where we talk about motivation, inspiration, dedication, and as always, tapping into your higher self. And we just want to give a special thank you to all the listeners that we have. I mean, it's, it's so many of you guys. And you just always pour into the podcast with all the feedback and just how it's impacting your life in such a great way. And at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, like giving back to people. So, you know, we thank you guys for listening. And as always, we have an amazing, phenomenal guest on the podcast that is joining us today. She is an author. She is a psychologist. I mean, she's she's just dynamic in every way. It's no other than Dr. Carla Marie Manley. What's going on, Carla? I am doing great here in sunny Sonoma County, California. Awesome. 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 Yeah, we, we're on opposite sides. We're here recording live from New York. So uh, ah, yeah. I love New York. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. So we, we're happy to have you. And, um, you know, we want to get into a lot of different things, um, just talking about specific topics, but I kind of gave like a, a glossed overview of you. So for the people who might not necessarily be familiar with you, can you tell them exactly who is Dr. Carla Marie Manley? I have many, many things. Probably what I would say where I shine most in life is in my role as an advocate and a clinical psychologist. It's my passion. It's my vocation. Um, I grew up on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, big family. I'm the ninth child in a family with 10 kids. And my path to becoming a psychologist was not linear. It was, I mean, I always knew I wanted to do that, but my family didn't think it was the highest use of my 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 being. And I eventually mm. made myself, um, I recreated myself. And so when I work with clients who have been set on a path because they think they should be doing it or they have to be doing it because what other people want, I'm a living example of, of somebody who broke free of all that with great cost to myself and am now and have been for you know years living the life of my dreams helping other people trying my best every day to be my best self you know constantly evolving and trying my best to give back to others and support mental health support well-being it's my thing wow well that that's dynamic and you know kind of just to piggyback off of what you said in terms of like blazing your own trail Mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people wrestle with that like they grow up in households And, you know, parents may have their ideal of what success looks like. So society tells us, well, be a doctor, be a lawyer, um, you know, go into these fields, be an athlete, you know, that's success, but true success is happiness. And that's what we come to terms with, you know, feeling fulfilled within yourself, you know? Absolutely. And you're right. I was told I was, I should be an attorney and um, I was in law school. And anyway, long story short, it took a lot of courage for me. And that's why to, to blaze my own path, as you say. And I really think that that's how we as individuals really find ourselves, right? Our best and highest selves is by constantly evolving and living our dream, whatever that is, because nobody can do it like you can do it. That's so that's out a there fact. and do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a fact. That's a fact. It's so true. It's so true. Blaze your own trail. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, you did an interview that was very, very, very interesting. And um, in that interview, you were basically discussing uh the topic of soul ties. Yeah. And you know, you 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 broke it down so eloquently, like every question that was asked of you, like you just had like such an interesting take and perspective on how you were able to explain that so you know we're going to dive into that because a lot of times we have like hot picks hot topics and this is a topic that a lot of listeners are interested in you know regardless if they're just curious about soulmates soul ties um you know soul tribes all these questions people have them for whatever reason so you know we're going to dig into this a little bit now you know 
for for people who who don't know what a soul tie is, can you just explain to the listeners like what exactly is a soul tie? Okay, so a soul tie. Some people think you have to be religious or truly deeply spiritual. I happen to be deeply spiritual to understand soul ties or believe in them. The way I like to look at it is, if you believe in science and the comfort com conservation of energy, right? Conservation of matter. If we look at that, then it would make sense, wouldn't it? That if we have souls, they're conserved. We don't lose them when we pass away. Those souls are somewhere. They're, mm. they're still existing. So I like to offer that, you know, from the onset so that people can really see, wait a second, it's just like light. It's just like matter. It's conserved. So you have a soul. I have a soul. Everyone has a soul. Let's hope. And so if you look and say, all right, I feel a really interesting special connection with this person. I'm not talking about necessarily romantic or sexual attraction. I am talking about that wonderful sense when you meet someone, you go, ah, oh, I feel you. You and I are connected somehow. It can happen through a glance as though you know that individual. There's a sense of knowing in a soul tie and it's not always positive, mind you. It, there can be toxic soul ties. But it's lovely when you think of a soul tie as that energy. What is a soul? Our soul is that essence of who we are. And so if our essence recognizes and is tied to another person's soul, that is a soul tie. Got you. Got you. So, you know, like you said, to kind of kind of piggyback off of what you said so a soul tie is where it's like it's familiar like you feel that feeling of like basically you're drawn to this person for whatever reason and you might not necessarily be able to put your your brain or wrap your brain around it but you just feel this strong connection towards this person and like you said it doesn't have to be sexual Right. And I also want to emphasize because kindred spirits also have that same kind of connection, mm -hmm. but it might not be a soul tie. So it's important to notice it's the essence. You're attracted to something in that person's essence. That is where the soul part comes in because our soul is our essence. When we get rid of all of that ego, all of that mess, right? And we go into soul, that's where the essence is of who we are. If we could just be naked right, of, of all of the stuff that comes with being human, then we would be left with the essence, with the soul tie, with the, with the soul that can get tied to someone else. And, and true to form, true to form, because like you said, you know, when, when they talk about energy, you know, even from a scientific perspective, right, what do they tell us? Energy never dies, right? right? Uh -huh. So if that's the case and that reigns supreme, then that lets us know that, well, your spirit never dies you know, right? It's like, it just goes on. So, you know, when you talk about a soul time, you think about what that means, that would make sense is that, you know, if you're drawn to this person, you're going to have that connection, you know, like it's yes. not going to go away. So that's key. So to transition from that, the next question that I had, because, and you, you did kind of mention kindred spirits, and that was within the next question that we have for you is, you know, what is the difference between a twin flame a kindred spirit and a soulmate, because those are like three different things. So, you know, can you kind of elaborate on the differences? Absolutely. So we have, just to recap, the soul, the soul tie, the soul connection is that sense of my essence knows your essence, right? This is, this is, this essence is here. We see each other. Now, when we move to a kindred spirit, the kindred spirit is like, oh, you're part of my family. Has nothing to do with DNA family. There's a part that's, ah, and that's why I really wanted to differentiate that the, the recognition, because you'll also recognize a kindred spirit, just like you will, uh, you know, a soul connection. But the kindred spirit will be like, oh, I, I like you. You're, you're part of my tribe. You're part of my people. That's the energy of a kindred spirit. Might be very different souls. There might not be a true soul connection, but there's an energy that you're part of my tribe, part of my people. Has nothing to do with demographics, nothing to do with, you know, shape, color, size, where you live. I've run into people where I'll sit next to them on the airplane and they'll feel like I've known them a thousand years or a girlfriend that I don't see for, you know, five years, and she's still my kindred, 
she's still my kindred spirit. There's just, right. you start talking after, you know, a month or two months and you don't have to physically see each other because when you talk, you're at peace with each other. You know each other. Those are kindred spirits, always positive. Mm -hmm. Kindred spirits are always positive. Doesn't mean that they don't have discord at times, but with twin flames and with soul connections, there can be toxic. Mm. With a kindred spirit, no. It will mm -hmm. always be this really positive energy, except mm. for if you have to work through an issue, right? Right. And even that can be positive. Okay, so then on to twin flames. Oh my goodness, twin flames are often misunderstood. People think that a twin flame means that it's synonymous with a soulmate. No, it's not. A twin flame is generally seen as somebody's who you have parts of the same soul. Some people look at it as being mirrors of the same soul or a fragment of the same soul. The interesting thing, so it's not a soul mate. A soul mate is, hey, we are connected to each other. We are meant to be romantic partners. Mm -hmm. We have found each other. Whereas a twin flame is almost like looking in a mirror and saying, oh, I recognize you, you recognize me, and we have something going on here. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what can happen with twin flames. Is the twin flame, you can meet someone who's a twin flame, and I believe that we're given challenges and people and opportunities always is an opportunity to grow now whether or not the other person is game for that mm -hmm. you know, it's not our we, we can't know that but often with twin flames you'll meet two people who are both dysfunctional and they'll meet each other they'll have that twin flame connection and they will continue the dysfunction mm -hmm. it might be fun and wonderful at first but then sparks will fly and the you know the candles will melt and it's not going to be a good thing right mm. they're enabling each other or codependent you know lots of dynamics can occur the flames right. are basically burning each other out absolutely much. beautifully said you can also have that happen this is a little more rare for those twin flames to come together and both people decide wow Ooh, this is toxic. Let's both heal together. That's generally quite difficult when you have two, let's say, two addicts coming together. Right, right. It doesn't allow for growth until the addiction is faced. So then you can have a two twin flames come together, one who's already evolving and one who might be toxic, dysfunctional. And that toxic, dysfunctional one may recognize the potential from seeing the mirror image of. of of what could be happening, this evolving nature and say, oh yeah, let me come along. Let me evolve with you. And the person who's evolving says, yeah, you come along with me, let's evolve together. And so that can be really beautiful. But again, the person who's not as high function needs to be really game for that, has to want to change. Because not to cut you off, Carla, because mm -hmm. that can actually go the opposite way, too, because oh, yeah. that person could probably become like a spiritual and emotional drainage on Absolutely. the other party. Hmm. Absolutely. When that happens, you're right. It can cause the um, person who was evolving to lose, as you said, energy and to start devolving because now they're just trying to survive. Mm. They're just trying to survive. So they're no longer growing. The third way I see twin flames coming together, and this to me is just, you know, one of the ideals is where you have two people who both come together and say, ah, oh, I see you. We have these flames and we can do good things. We can help each other grow as individuals. We can help our relationship grow romantic or not romantic. And thus, think about it. When we have a good light, and the person that we're encountering, whether it's a girlfriend, a guy friend, a romantic partner, or whatever, a coworker, and our flames become joined. Look what happens. We become more light for ourselves, more light for the relationship, and more light for the world, mm -hmm. which is, you know, one of a huge purpose for many of us. If we're light workers, we want that light to shine. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that is one of the best ways that um, twin flames can use their power. But we always, when we're talking about energy and power, we have to be really mindful and respectful that we can choose consciously and unconsciously to put our power, our energy to work for the good or not mm -hmm. so good. No, absolutely. I, I mean, you, you just unpack 
a lot of gems. Because <laughs> there's a lot within that. And, you know, I think like it's important for people like, you know, we talk about on this podcast, the trilogy, right? Mind, body, and soul. Mm -hmm. So being in tune with everything, it's like, you know, if you take care of, of your body, but your mind is always depressed, well, you're not in alignment. You know, if you take care of your body, but your soul is in a bad place. So yeah, your exterior may look great, but you're toxic on the inside. So you know, it's important when we talk about these things, especially how you just broke it down so great when we're looking at like, um, you know, the twin flames and, you know, the kindred spirits and the soulmates, being able to be aware of that to guard your spirit because aligning yourself with the wrong spirit can actually be, you know, just catastrophic to your destiny, you know, like, like someone that can pull you down and drain you down and you're, you're getting it confused because I think a lot of people, they, they might think that someone is, is their soulmate, you know, or this person is, is, is a, a driving force in their life, but it's actually a drainage. So that, I mean, you, you made some great points. So I hope, you know, all the listeners, y'all, y'all are taking notes. If you're not, you can rewind. <laughs> it's a beautiful feature. Um, <laughs> so going into the, um, the next question that I had for you. So, what are the three major signs that you found a soul tie? So like, you know, for the people out here listening who, who might feel like, yo, you know, I found my soulmate. This is my person. Like, what are like the major elements? Because I mean, you did talk about it before, but is there anything maybe that she didn't say before that, you know, I know you said the spirit, you feel drawn to that person. What are there any other things that people listening would should be mindful of? Absolutely. So let's remember that there are positive soul ties and negative soul ties. So let's stick with positive soul ties. What are some signs of positive soul ties? Respect. A mm. positive soul tie will come with respect, integrity, transparency, honesty. Mm. There will be a sense of let's up level each other, right? Let's connect. Let's be our best selves, right? I see you. So very synergistic right? That again, not that soul ties or positive ones are always trouble free. No, 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 no. We don't want to even think about perfection. When we go into this realm, we want to think about if issues come up, how are they handled? If ruptures come up, how are they handled? Are we handling them in positive growth oriented ways? Those are signs of a positive soul connection. Okay. Positive soul tie. Negative soul tie. Oh my goodness. Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. You will, there will be, and it's not that both people have to participate in this. You can just have one toxic person, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one not. But when there's a negative soul tie, there will be controlling behavior, manipulative behavior. There will be a sense of um, often jealousy, there will be often dishonesty, things like gaslighting. Mm. So sometimes we do, and I tend to call this cording, C-O-R-D-I-N-G, where you're corded to someone else in this, I almost think of like this negative umbilical cord. Mm. And it is there. And this person just shows up sometimes in manipulative ways, sometimes in lovely ways, right? Where they're, they're there. And then all of a sudden they turn on you and they become, it's like a, Dekel, a Jekyll and Hyde. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right. 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 So those are signs that there is definitely a negative soul tie at mm -hmm. work. And those we really want to work at not strengthening, like we want to strengthen and, and really just give loads of love to our positive soul ties. If there's a negative soul tie at work, you just want to start noticing that it exists. Don't judge yourself that you've gotten caught into it. Because if we judge ourselves, it just makes things worse. Instead, just start noticing as you would red flags. Oh my goodness, this dynamic's happening. This isn't good. How can I take care of myself? How can I cut this negative soul tie? And how can I move forward to keep this force out of my life because we're just talking energy we don't want to call the person a bad person mm -hmm. we just want to say hey this person is not good for our energy because right. we really want our energy to be positive mm -hmm. no absolutely that and you know what that's dynamic what you said because that actually leads into the next question that we had because yeah you want to protect your energy at all costs you know yeah. there's a saying that that i love and it's you know i love you but i love me more 
So at the end of the day, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your well-being. And once you notice that someone goes from being an asset in your life to becoming a liability where it's like, you know, it's just negative. And the reality is that sometimes I think we also like the mind can play tricks on you because, you know, you start thinking about the good times and the good old days, but Mm -hmm. that's not necessarily an accurate reflection of your current situation where you are with this person. So, you know, it's like, you gotta, I think a lot of times we got to hold ourselves accountable, you know, like we, people do what you allow. And at the end of the day, it's like, you can show people better and you can tell them. You know, so, you know, you said it so eloquently, which which leads us into this other dynamic here. Um, before how... I question, before, sorry, to, sorry to interject. I do have it's to fine. say, it's when fine. you say people do what we allow, mm-hmm. sometimes people do what we don't allow. Mm. And let me explain why I'm saying this. Sometimes when we're under stress, when we're sur- just trying to survive, right? When we're in a stress and survival mode, sometimes people are doing things and we aren't aware of them. So they're occurring, but our direction, I like to think of it like we're, there are times in life when we're in survival mode in the middle of an ocean and we're hanging on to this little inner tube, right? And there's somebody in the water who's a shark and they're nipping it. And it's not that we're allowing them to nip at us and pull us under. We are just doing our best to stay in that little life life you know ring Mm -hmm. maybe make it to the island we see in the difference in in the distance so i think there are times where we have to look and not judge ourselves and say wait a second maybe i was unaware Mm -hmm. i wasn't actively telling this person come in and torment me or harm me but now that i'm becoming aware i do not i refuse to let this happen anymore Mm -hmm. and so we can let go of that judgment and just say maybe i didn't just didn't have the wherewithal to notice, but I notice it now. Absolutely. I wanted to add that for so that any listeners who might be feeling guilty, don't feel guilty. Guilt serves no purpose except to help you do better the next time. That's right. That's right. You know, it's it's never a loss. It's always a a lesson, you know, and you use that knowledge to just go on a better trajectory, you know? So, so yeah, that's, that's definitely on point. So, you know, I wanted to ask you this question too, because, um, you know, a lot of times I've, I've heard people say, um, you know, when it comes to intimacy, they're like, well, you know, sex is just sex. They're like, you know what, we can, I can be intimate with as many people as I want to be. And it's just that. So when we talk about it from a, a spiritual side and a soul ties, um, I wanted to, to get your opinion on that. Like, do you think that that's a factual statement or if you're thinking about it from like the spiritual side with soul ties and good energy and bad energy, is that a false statement? Meaning that every time you engage uh, sexually with a partner, that there is some part of us that is, you know, there's an exchange of energy, spiritual energy, soul energy, and it's not just the physicality of it. Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? It's such a good question, and I've been asked it before, and I like to tread very carefully so as to not offend people, but I will do my best. Um, So when we look at the difference first between sex and sexual intimacy, two different things, right? I personally believe that, so let's define the two. Sex is what animals do. All animals are capable of sex. So two bodies coming together, sharing a sexual action, okay? Sexual intimacy requires us to be present intimately, to be vulnerable, to be emotionally available, and to really share our innermost spirit with that other person while our bodies are combining. So our bodies are connected, and so is the spirit into me intimacy is into me, come into me, right? So in a very sacred way. So then to answer your question in a couple of stages, when we are sexual with someone, just sexual, have we shared part of our being with them? Of course we have. Just even the cells, when you think on a cellular level, we've exchanged some cells in doing that. So our cells are now, you know, within that other person and theirs are within us on a certain level. Can we compartmentalize so that we don't feel that as 
any form of connection other than just a sexual act, absolutely we can compartmentalize. Do I believe that our souls, that our spirits, which are different from souls, and that our minds and bodies know that we have interacted with someone on a very you know, deep level because that's our body and our body's connecting with another body? Think if somebody hits you, right? Just somebody hitting you, you remember. I, you know, somebody recently like pushed me in the back. I remember that it was, it didn't feel good. Right. And my body remembers it. My mind remembers it. If we can remember something like that, how could we not remember and register a sexual encounter? We may want to believe it doesn't matter. I personally believe, and I'm not judging. I believe it does matter. I believe it matters to the body, to the mind, to the soul and the spirit. So that said, without judging it, when we look at sexual intimacy, so if, so if you're looking at people who do a lot of hookups, and I work with people who come to me of all ages who say, hey, I was in a really hookup mindset, and I realized it wasn't working for me. I was waking up not liking myself. I was waking up forgetting who I had been with. It didn't make me feel good about me. And so what I ask people to do is look at your situation. If you're having, you know, hookups and they're making you feel worse about yourself or another person feel worse about themselves, then maybe it's time to do some assessment about why are you doing this? Mm. Because in many cases, not to overgeneralize, but um, in many cases, males will engage in um, hookups because we, our ancestors, you know, we had to catch, we had to catch the woman survival of the species, right? In many cases, women and men will participate in order to feel validated, in order to feel pretty or handsome or loved or wanted. And that's not necessarily the healthiest way to feel validated. One of the healthiest and most long lasting ways to feel, to feel validated is to love yourself and then to have friends and family and people around you who validate you and appreciate you for who you are. We won't find that in sexual hookups. It's so fleeting and we often, the cost you know, benefit analysis, we often feel worse in the long run than, than better. And that is that, that information that I'm offering comes from working with clients males and females who, uh, and, you know, people of all sexual orientations who tell me that it doesn't feel good. Once they pause to look at it, especially if they're not onboarding um, medications and self-soothing substances, right? Once they're more in a sober state, they realize it did not feel good to them in the long term. Some of them really loathe how they behave toward other people. Many loathe how they behave toward themselves. Did that answer your question? It absolutely did. I mean, it, this is great because, you know, that that leads me to another question, you know, because when we talk about protecting, you know, our mental, our physical, our spirit. So in your opinion, would it be problematic for someone? And I guess, you know, for the listeners, this is a, a great question. Um, should I mean, for obvious reasons, STDs and all that stuff aside, but just from the spiritual, like we're going to take the the STDs out of it and all that stuff from the spiritual side of it for men and women alike would you say that it's critical for people to be mindful of who they're engaging sexually with based upon body counts because let's say if we're talking about that exchange happening right all those spirits and stuff like that and let's say that you know a woman she engages with a man who let's say he's been with like 50 different women um I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about it from the spiritual perspective, not even from the, you know, the physicality, just like, you know, what's your take on that? My take, like you said, let's put the pragmatic pieces of STDs, et cetera, out of the picture. Um, let's pretend there are no children in the picture who are mm -hmm. getting affected, right? Because kids know a lot more. I work with a lot of adult adults who were aware of what their parents were doing when they were little or, you know, a single Boy, mom, single geez. dad. So let's, let's take the little, little kids, the impressionable kids out of the picture and just pretend we have two single consenting adults. If you're with someone, and again, this comes from clinical experience as well as personal experience. If you are with someone who uses sex as just a tool if that does not line up with your spiritual ethos, it will damage you. Mm. 
Mm. And I also come, have come to believe that even people who believe it doesn't damage their spiritual ethos come to at some point in time to look and say, God, I wish I hadn't turned through people like that. I wish I could remember names, dates, faces. I wish I knew somebody's, you know, preferences, what they liked, what they didn't like, um, as far as being a human being. And so I think when we devalue, again, this is personal, my personal perspective. I think when we devalue sexual intimacy and, and just make it instead just sheer hard sex, I think we devalue one of the most sacred gifts we can give to each other. Because for me, I think sexual intimacy is one of the most precious and beautiful gifts that we can choose to share with another person. And let me give you an example. If I gave you a key to my house, just met you on the street and said, here, have a key to my house, come in, do whatever you want. How is that going to feel to me in the long term? And you just, and I meet you on the street, and you're like, hey, come to my house, right? Here's the key, do whatever you want. Right, that because key. the key the key symbolizes trust, right? Yes, so that yes, you, you can't it. just give it to anybody. If, if I give someone a key to where I stay, it's because I trust you. You know you what I'm saying? Trust me, yes. And so if I just give you the key to my house or apartment or you know, hotel room, whatever, I'm just saying, I don't really care. I don't really care about being respected, about having a bond of trust and friendship with you. And I'm not judging anyone who gives out their keys, you know, indiscriminately, but our body is our house. This is the house we have on on this planet. Mm -hmm. And if I have learned, and I actually learned this from a girlfriend a long time ago, she said, Carla, you wouldn't just give anyone the keys to your house, would you? They have to earn your trust. And I remember that conversation. I said, absolutely, you're right. Absolutely. And this was just about relationships, not about sex, right? And it's the same with sexuality, that we want someone to earn the privilege of coming into our house. The house that is our sacred house, it is the one body that we have. It is the one body. And we can move physical houses, but we cannot move from this this body of a house. And so to me, it is important for us to assess who we want to let into our home, the home of our physical body on a sexual level, why we're letting them in, and how it will feel to us in the long run. Wow. And and where it gets a little bit confusing is we are humans. We do have passion, you know, in a new relationship, there's the limerent stage and we're all excited and our hormones are going. And so sometimes we do make decisions that aren't the wisest. Yet, if we slow, learn to slow down and reflect and say, um, I used to say all the time, my body is my temple, my body is my temple, right? And if we realize that we each have a body that is our temple to take care of, mentally, physically, spiritually, on all of these different ways, then we might be a lot more careful about who we gain access, who we give access to um, for sexual reasons. Definitely, 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 you know, and, um, you know, to your point, you know, access, access is key, you know, you don't give access to just anybody, and you have to protect that at all costs, you know, so that. You, you know, once again, amazing points, Carla. And, you know, this kind of leads into the other question that we had. You know, if you find yourself in a position, I'm pretty sure, you know, some of the listeners, there a lot of them in great, healthy relationships. And then there's a lot of them that are in toxic relationships. And they have these, um, the, these negative relationships, these negative soul ties, um, you know, not real soulmates, just what they think is a soulmate, but it's destroying them, right? So, for people that are in that situation, how do, how do they break that? Like once you find yourself in that, because I know you said before, you know, it's great to be aware, be cognizant of this. It's kind of like that cord that's attaching you to this person. So what does it look like fundamentally um, to walk someone through that process to like, you know, just cut that off? Because we know, um, you know, a lot of times, like when people, I know when they talk about like abuse, some people I've heard them say like, oh, you know, well, you know, psychological abuse is 
far worse than the physicality of someone hitting you. Because, you know, if you get a bruise, it will heal. If someone's a, a narcissist, they're gaslighting you, they break you down mentally, those scars last. So I think, you know, even from the spiritual perspective, like if you've got that connection and you're so involved and entangled in this, um, this thing spiritually, you know, that takes a lot more. So what does that look like to you if you had to describe breaking that? Good, good question. And I agree with you that the physical abuse is horrific when there is mental abuse, emotional abuse, you know, all the various forms of abuse, financial, et cetera, spiritual. When we look, people will, clients will tell me, I wish I had a broken jaw or a black and blue mark. At least someone would believe me how awful it is. At least my family would understand why I'm leaving this perfect partner who's not perfect because they don't see a bruise on me. They think everything's fine. So that said, for those of you out there who are suffering from abuse, reach out for support. That's the first thing I can say. And the statistics, it's alarming. Domestic violence is reported to be one in every four individuals has experienced wow. domestic violence. Now get this. Here's what's more stunning. That is what's reported. Right. So you think about all of those people who think that being emotionally abused, sexually abused within a relationship, spiritually abused, financially abused, and all those who are mentally abused, but are afraid to report it because they're doctors, lawyers, teachers, and they don't want to tell anyone, or their husband's a policeman. So they don't want you know him to lose his job. Mm -hmm. That one in four is just what's reported. Wow. I really believe from my work that it's much closer to at least half of relationships. Wow. There is some form, if not a little more. So what I would tell people is if you realize that you are in a relationship that is toxic for you, whether it was always toxic or it's becoming toxic, reach out for support. And one of the ways you can do that, so many communities have free clinics, low cost clinics. Um, you can also do um, individual psychotherapy, group psychotherapy. I ran a women's support group with over 300 members for you know, a decade. And so there are groups like that. There's also bibliotherapy, which simply means find a good self-help book that gives you exercises that you can work on. And, and my books all have exercises. And if you need something free of charge, go to my website, look for the Your Journey worksheets. They're in there. They're free of charge. You don't have to Pay, pay a penny for them and do those your journey worksheets as you start doing a little bit of self work you will start building the self esteem that is necessary for you to start to move forward in positive ways it, you might have to baby step it if you're in a physically abusive situation where your life is threatened of course call the domestic violence hotline do not hesitate most communities have safe houses where you will go and you'll be protected so the other piece that really gets in the way of people reaching out for support when there's you know abuse at work is that feeling of shame of how could I have done this to myself? How, how could I, a mom, you know, a firefighter, a teacher, or whatever I am, how, you know, a, a, you know, a computer guru, how could I be in this kind of relationship? Because right. you're human. Because you, like me, like everyone else on the planet is human. And we make mistakes. And sometimes we're in a relationship that's we, that starts off wonderful. And as soon as a commitment's made or before a commitment's made, it starts going downhill and devolving. Mm -hmm. and you don't see it devolving. You think, oh, it's just a one-off. And then it happens again. And then you mm -hmm. find an excuse for it. So don't blame yourself. Use your energy in a positive way. Use your energy to, energy to get support with someone, it's a lot of the work that I do. And so I know how it works. It's just important for you to get someone who can help you be objective because when you're in an abusive situation, you may blame yourself. You might think you're crazy. You might think you're the one who's broken. No, 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 no. Just get rid of all that shame and guilt and instead start doing some self-work, reach out for support, where you can then start getting, you know, strong legs underneath you to walk out that door someday or have the person walk out the door. You don't have to always be the one who leaves. That's that's right. That's 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 excellent advice. You know, it makes me think about this quote uh, that I have. It says, uh, you know, 
giving um, everyone access to you is poor spiritual hygiene, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you have to have those boundaries. You have to establish standards. And to your point, it's like, you know, I think when you see patterns, pay attention to the patterns and the Mm -hmm. red flags, you know, and let your spirit be your compass and your guide as well. It's like, you know, if it feels off, if, if this person starts to become a drainage, a, a force of negativity in your life, and they're always putting you down and you just feel like crap, you know, those are clear cut signs that this is toxic. And regardless of what it started out as, this is not what it is today. You know, so I've, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, oh, you know, well, he used to be so good to me. Or, you know, oh, she used to be so great to me. You know, she doesn't mean it. You know, that's just my crazy girlfriend or that's just my crazy. And they rationalize the behavior and they normalize it, you know, like, you know, and you never want to find yourself in that position. You always want to find yourself, like you said, in a position of being in a healthy, positive, strengthening, good, you know, just great base relationship that you do have, you know, and that's not to say, like you said, you know, everybody has problems. We get that. But there are certain problems that are toxic, you know, they're they're null and void. Absolutely. I agree with you 100 percent. And I think every relationship, my fourth book is coming out next year. The working title is it's about imperfect love. And I really look, I just took things down to the bare foundation so that people can look at these basic concepts that we need in healthy relationships, genuine friendship, emotional intelligence, good communication skills, and how to massage all of our relationships, whether it's a romantic one, a work one, a friendship, so that we can know what imperfection looks like and accept imperfection but also really know what toxic behavior looks like and keep that out of our relationship and use our energy to create ever better selves and relationships. Because I believe that's one purpose that we can all share on this planet is having the purpose of evolving as our best selves and helping others evolve. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, well, well, we're we're winding down. We got three more questions for you. So we're getting there, but this, this is awesome. This is awesome. So uh, one of the questions that, that we had here, um, because, you know, I've heard the term spirit guide, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is a thing. Like I've I've heard people um, talk about spirit guides and they feel like, well, you know, this person is my, you know, the spirit guide, this person is in my life. Um, you know, to help guide me through and always gives me great advice or, you know, just there for me. I feel this connection. So what, you know, for, for the listeners out there that might not be familiar with it or they, they know the term, but they don't know necessarily what to look for. Like, what is a spirit guide and how can you tell who that person is in your life? Like what attributes, traits should you look for that are clear cut signs that this is a spirit guide that was placed in your path? Great question. So a spirit guide um, doesn't need to be older than you or younger than you. It's simply an individual who shows up in a way that really, truly supports you along your life path to be your better self, whether it's on an a personal level, whether it's within relationships, it could be within your career. And it's interesting when you have a spirit guide, they may be there for a very short time, or they may be there for a very long time or even a lifetime, but you feel as if this person has come into your world to be of service to you in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. They may open doors that were closed. They may help you see the um, parts of you that are talented that you minimized or never noticed. Mm -hmm. They may say, oh, I see that that's a great piece of art that you did. And you say, oh, no, no, I'm not a great artist. Oh, no, no, this belongs in a gallery, right? That is kind of an example of what a spirit guide could do in the more material world. In the emotional world, a spirit guide may see that you're stuck or suffering and come in and say, ah, I'm not judging you, but I see that you've gotten into this habit, right? Would you like some support in getting out of this habit or out of this toxic relationship? I'm here as a force of love. That is what a spirit guide will feel like, a force of love. 
Wow. I love that. You know, a force of love, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's strength based, right? It's like, oh, love, nice. you know, but being, being a strong, positive force in your life. So yeah, definitely. That, that, that's amazing. So another question I have for you, you know, we ask every single guest that's on the podcast. Um, what is a mantra that you have for yourself? Mine's is, well, I have two. The first one is collaboration is greater than competition. So always surrounding yourself with like-minded people that build each other up. And then the second one is persistence wears down resistance. So no matter what the obstacle is, you know, it's just an opportunity. Like, you know, you just got to keep chiseling away at it. So, so what is your, uh, your mantra? And you can have more than one, you know, we're just curious okay. to know. I'll shoot, two, I'll share two of my, three of my favorite. One is actually next to me on my desk, have courage and be kind. So I really try to have courage about whatever, if somebody's, something's a little scary, it's like, oh, it's okay, I can do this. I'll have courage and I'll be kind uh, in, in the process, right? So have courage and be kind, that's one. Another was actually an Audrey Hepburn quote that stuck with me years ago. And it's always be a first rate version of yourself. Mm. And I really, because sometimes when we're under stress, we can get a little snippety or you know aggressive or whatever it is. And I always try to remember just be a first rate version of myself. I don't care what anyone else is doing. I want to be a first rate version of me. And it's simpler than it's a lot more difficult than it sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Because that means that, you know, often I'll go to bed at night and going, okay, well, I did this, I did this. What could I do better tomorrow? How can I be better tomorrow? So that's one. The other one that I came across a couple of years ago and just really struck me and I keep it up on my wall. And it's actually from the Bible. And it says, here I am, send me. And it's from Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And the reason I really liked it is because it's saying to the divine, whatever the divine means to you, right? Here I am. I'm just an instrument. And please help me do good in the world. Here I am. Send me where I can do the most good. And I really love that because I know whether it's with my psych with my clinical practice or my books or speaking or podcasts, it's like, send to me whoever needs me and if you send them i will say yes and so i always try to say yes that's awesome that's awesome that that's amazing that, those are some great uh great mantras i might have to borrow some <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'm awesome. laughs> yeah so so we started in the beginning we let the listeners know that you're an amazing author and that you have some phenomenal books. So, you know, a lot of stuff that, um, you know, we spoke about it just in general, just being motivated, howling to be the, the best version and most dynamic and powerful version of yourself that you can be. So, you know, these are uh, these books that you have, you know, Joy from Defeat, um, you know, and then you have uh, Transform Your Relationships and Love Fearlessly. Can you just, you know, talk about these books what they entail um you know just just give us all the all the details so there so far i have three books i only mentioned two of them to you but i'll mention all three so the first one is joy from fear transform um oh it's right here in my door um, oh i said i said joy from defeat i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Joy from Fear, Create the Life of Your Dreams by Making Fear Your Friend. That was my first book. And it's all about, for people who can't afford psychotherapy or in psychotherapy and want something to augment their journey, it is real life advice, case studies, actionable ways to transform your life, to get unstuck and to learn that fear is not your enemy. Fear is your friend. And that when we learn to recognize that fear is just saying, for example, oh, Carla, you can't do this. You can't write, you know, a fifth book. You have too much on your plate. Oh, well, is that true? Or is that fear talking to me? Right. Or somebody might say, oh, I'm afraid to do public speaking. OK. And they might turn down an invitation. Well, wait a second. That's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to face that fear, practice your speech in front of the mirror and get up and give the best speech you can. If you make some mistakes, pay, go with the flow. Everything will be fine. So that's, but Joy from Fear talks about everything from red flags in relationships, domestic violence, anxiety, patterns of abuse, um, all sorts of things that are real life that how, how can we transform our world? Our internal worlds and external worlds so that we ultimately live the life we want because life is way too short 
So yes. that's the first book. The second book I wrote, which was actually designed for people in their 30s and forward, and the publishers reworked it to be for 50s and their forward, because a lot of people, particularly women, as soon as they hit you know, 25, they feel old. I have so many clients saying, I'm no longer relevant. I'm too old. And they're all of 25 years old. So mm -hmm. I wanted to do a book that was telling people, wait, aging is a mindset. And so it's called Aging Joyfully. And it's about how you can look at your age, whatever age you are, and take good care of yourself, find your purpose, be able to really live your best life, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever age you are, age is really a mindset. And how to be aware in your life if you're, if you're committing ageism toward yourself or toward other people, because, you know, we really want to do more in our society than prize you know, age 17 as the optimal age to be, right? Yeah. And every age, you know, has amazing benefits. So that was my second book. My third book, which came out last year, is Date Smart, Transform Your Relationships and Love Fearlessly. Mm -hmm. and that is a wonderful guide to knowing whether you're currently dating or you're in a romantic relationship. It's about how to know what you want from a relationship, what you have to give in a relationship, how to notice red flags, how to work on boundaries so that you can have really healthy friendships that are built on respect, that are built on friendship, how to, I have to, had to be very careful as I always try to be not to be judgmental, but it does go into sexuality and how to honor your own sexuality and what's working for you and what's not working for you, even if it means to take a time out from dating so you can recalibrate. Mm -hmm. And so that was my, my third book. And like I said, my fourth book, which is just a gem it's in its final you know publication process now will be really about it's tentatively entitled the joy of imperfect love and it is about how we can take whatever relationships we have and fine tune them pretty much along the lines we've talked about today to mm -hmm. be the best they can be and how we within those relationships can be our best selves and really shine because if we aren't shining as individuals we won't shine in relationships in our professions or in any part of the world we may have that mask on that we talked about earlier we may mm -hmm. think they look good but we don't want things to look good from the outside we want things to be good from the inside that's that's right that's right you know those are excellent points and um it's kind of like you know the the whole overall encompassing theme like you know to be happy be truly happy and, and happiness is an inside job. So just constantly work on yourself, work on your mental, work on your spirit, work on your physical to make sure that you're in a space where you build yourself up, you know, and, and protect your energy at all costs. And, you know, it's perfect what you said about the key. It's like, you know, don't give everyone access to you, you know, and I think like, you know, it's, you know, access to the spirit and just the mind and just engaging people. That should be a privilege. You know, you should value yourself enough not to spread yourself around thin to everybody because, you know, I, I kind of look at it like, um, you know, diamonds, right? Diamonds retain value. And why is that? Because, you know, not everybody has, it. you know, like a good quality diamond is like, you know, it holds its value. So you should look at yourself as that diamond. You know, you you have value. You are valuable. So treat yourself as such. You know, everyone shouldn't have access to you, whether that's mentally, physically, spiritually. Like, you know, take time for yourself, you know, so. I just have to say how sweet that is, Kyle, that you said that, because I often say that to clients wow. thinking about the diamond. I tell them, if you put yourself in the free bin on the curb <laughs> or on the sale rack outside the store, People will treat you like the free item in the bin or the sale. But if you put yourself behind the case like a precious diamond and say, I am precious. I know I am precious. Access is restricted here. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. And not that you're better than other people, but that you know your value and you say, hey, that's why we keep our gems you know, yes. in cases behind behind those behind the, the jewelry store counter. We don't yes. put them in the free bin. We put yes. them there, right? So, yes. Yeah, so you listeners, each one of you is a sacred gem, a diamond, a ruby, an emerald, whatever. You are sacred and treat yourself that way. Yes. You know, someone has to 
to be able to gain access to you in a respectful way. They just can't take you out of a free bin. Of course. And, and the conversation's different. You know, like I've, I've heard, I've been in rooms and I've heard how the conversation's going. We all have, you know, it's like, you know, when, when people are too familiar with people and they know them and they, they've had access to them, they talk about them differently than the people that are more, more of a gem. You know, mm -hmm. everyone doesn't have access to them. They don't know as much, you know, like, and that adds to the value. The value goes up because it's like, okay, well, who is this person? You know, and they carry themselves a certain way and they're, they're respectful. Like, you know, so you're right about that. You know, absolutely. You no, know, right. you, you made the perfect point. And it's interesting when you think about, I know we're winding down, but when you think about it with a gem, somebody's buying a diamond ring, they know the cut, the clarity, the mm -hmm. weight, all of those different numbers and letters that go with diamond valuation, right? And sometimes a person we sleep with, we don't even know their first name. Yeah. Yet for an actual physical diamond, we'll know a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so we really want to treat ourselves. If, if that matters to us, as though someone needs to know us, who we are, and gain access to us by building trust and friendship. And then maybe we decide to share our diamond with them. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Well, it, this was amazing. This was awesome. And this was just phenomenal. Thank you know, you. We, we just thank you for taking the time today. And oh, my um, pleasure. Such yeah. a joy. Thank you. Yeah, Kyle. same here. Anytime, anytime. Thank you, listeners. Yes, yes. Y'all can play it back. Y'all can uh, rewind and, you know, certain things that you might have not been too clear on. Uh, yeah, definitely. Most definitely, uh, you know, play it back. So once again, this has been the Diagnosis Success Podcast. We thank you all for listening. And thanks to our amazing guest. That's my alarm right on time. So... <laughs> So yeah, we just, we appreciate you calling. Thank you so much again. Take good care. Same here.